Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News contributors Dr. Holly Phillips and Dr. Tara Narula. First up, new CDC guidelines for doctors caring for pregnant women who may have been exposed to Zika. The mosquito-borne virus is linked to birth defects. And doctors in Brazil now say it could be linked to a rare syndrome that can leave patients almost completely paralyzed for weeks. Tara, the reports on this virus are really scary. What is it exactly and how can it affect the fetus? Sure. So this is a virus that's mosquito born and it was originally really predominant in Africa and Asia but in the last two years we've seen a large spread of this in Central and South America and the concern has really been for pregnant women and what the effect might be on the fetus. This came to light in Brazil first. What we've seen there is that there's been an increase in the number of cases of a birth defect called microcephaly. Mm -hmm. The annual caseload in Brazil is usually 150 cases of microcephaly. Since October we've seen over 3,500 cases. This defect is characterized by a small skull or head size in the infant, usually significant for an underlying problem with brain development. In many cases, it can be mild, but in some cases, it can be severe, where the child has problems with development, intellectual milestones, feeding, vision, hearing problems. There's no cure or treatment for microcephaly. And it's not unusual that we could see a viral link. We know that viruses like CMV, rubella, and varicella also have been linked to the development of microcephaly. But would you, if you were a mother, you were carrying, would you only know at delivery something was wrong or would there be symptoms? Right. Well, you know, one of the things that makes this virus so hard to track is that 80% of people who are infected have absolutely no symptoms. Those who do get symptoms, they're pretty mild and resolve in about a week. Uh, you see fever, joint pain, rashes, conjunctivitis, which is a redness in the eyes. Uh, but there's also now a possible link with a more serious autoimmune disease called Guillain-Barre, which causes paralysis that is sometimes reversible, but not always. Uh, so women who've been exposed may not, well, in fact, know it in time. So if you don't even know, I mean, could you treat it if you did at least know? Yeah, the problem is at this point, there is no vaccine to wow. prevent contracting the illness and there's no uh, medication that can cut down on it. So at this point, the focus is really on avoiding infection, making sure women who are pregnant or who are planning to become pregnant avoid areas where they could get bitten by mosquitoes that carry the virus. Sarah, that's the advice the CDC is giving, just stay away? Yeah, so the CDC came out last week and said that for all pregnant women in any trimester, they should really postpone travel to any of these areas in Latin and Central America that have been affected by Zika. And if they are planning to go, if they have to go, they should speak to their doctor and take precautions like using repellents, wearing long sleeve clothes, staying in screened in rooms. They've also counseled women who may be considering getting pregnant to potentially talk to their doctor and avoid travel there. This week, they went a step further and issued interim guidelines to healthcare practitioners telling them that they should be screening all of their pregnant patients for recent travel. And if, in fact, their pregnant patients have traveled to these areas and reported two or more symptoms in the two weeks around their travel, they should get the blood test for the Zika virus and potentially further testing, including ultrasounds. Even if they have no symptoms, but they've traveled within those two weeks, they should get an ultrasound and then potentially further testing after that. And you know, you know, it's unclear how far this is really going to spread in mm -hmm. our country. I know everybody's really afraid. We think that the outbreak will, in this country will increase in the sense that we'll see more cases, both imported and local, because the mosquito, the 80s mosquito, does live in the Gulf Coast states of the United States. But hopefully it'll be more isolated and focal because we have better sanitation, housing, air conditioning and mosquito control efforts. Well, next up, an experimental test from Duke University researchers could help determine whether patients who are feeling sick need antibiotics. This seems like it's long overdue because so many people I've heard, I've heard you both say take antibiotics when they don't need it. Are, are the test results successful? Right. Well, right now they seem to be really quite accurate. So this is a test that examines specific genes that are expressed by our immune system when the immune system is fighting off a respiratory infection. Uh, in one study, uh, researchers administered the test to 300 people and it had an 80 percent accuracy rate of helping to distinguish between whether the infection was caused by a virus like the common cold or flu or by a bacterial infection like strep throat or even if the symptoms weren't caused by an infection at all. Uh, now this is so important because we know that viral infections, respiratory infections are one of the main reasons people go to the doctor, right? As a general internist that's what I get coming through the door kind of all day in the winter time. Uh, and in three quarters of those cases people are, 
are prescribed antibiotics, but the vast majority of, time, of the time they're not necessary. So a test like this can really help us pinpoint who needs antibiotics and who doesn't. Yeah, because, I mean, Tara, as, as Holly points out, I mean, what, 50% of antibiotics prescribed aren't necessary, they're that, saying? That's right. 50% are inappropriate, and that means $3 billion in excess costs. So a test like this could really be cost-saving, number one. Number two, it could help with medication-related adverse drug events. We know that antibiotics are responsible for one out of five emergency room visits. Five to 25 percent of people who take antibiotics will have some sort of adverse drug event. Yeah. So it could certainly assist with that. And then it can assist with the big public health threat of antibiotic resistance. There are about two million illnesses that are antibiotic resistant, and it accounts for about 23,000 deaths annually. And finally, you know, for viral illnesses, we don't really have a lot to offer people right now. We tell them, go home, get in your bed, rest eat chicken soup and drink orange juice. Yep. So a test like this could help us really better and further the research into treatments, medications for viral illnesses. All right, this next story might come to mind the next time you head out to eat. Researchers at Tufts University in Boston found 92% of popular restaurant menu choices exceed recommended calorie limits for a single meal. The worst culprits were American, Chinese, and Italian eateries, which had nearly 1,500 calories per meal. Federal guidelines for average adults recommend between 2,000 and 2,500 calories a day, depending on factors like age and gender. Yeah, Ouch. I, yes, the Italian food hurts me the most. <laughs> I was say. Like Chinese. I thought it would be Mexican food. I was yeah. surprised. The Chinese, you'd think vegetables are at least right. in that. I, I mean, it's so easy to, to think of fast food as the villain, right, for all these extreme yeah. calorie counts. But this shows restaurant food. You know, these are restaurants are, that were both large chain and small local yeah. restaurants yeah. where they don't even have to list calorie counts. Uh, you know, and we're still getting a lot of excess calories from It's all in the sauce, I think. It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> the best part. Dr. Holly Phillips, Dr. Tara Narula, thank you both so much.